Well, I hope you had a great uh, weekend. I know that I did because I am emotionally dysfunctional and codependent. Uh, and that means that my mood is determined by the fate of my favorite football team, which is which is really strange when you think about it and, and, and kind of sad and pathetic. But the Ravens uh, dominated yet again yesterday, so I'm feeling pretty good. In fact, I'm feeling even better because I get to spend the first part of, of this show discussing a football-related topic, which I always enjoy. And that's the one thing that I will thank Colin Kaepernick for is that he he gives me an excuse every once in a while to uh, talk about football in the show. So I do like that. Yes, Kaepernick over the weekend exposed who he has been all along, who, who I think he has plainly been all along, which is uh, that he is a, a con man. He's not interested in, in playing football. He's interested in PR stunts. This shouldn't be news to anyone, but I think maybe it is. And so we'll get into that. We'll talk about it. Um, along with several other topics, including speaking of people being exposed, Prince Andrew uh, was interviewed by the BBC in regards to rape allegations against him and in regards to his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein, who, by the way, didn't kill himself. And Prince Andrew offers what I honestly think is the worst alibi I have ever heard in my life. And I'm not exaggerating. It's not hyperbole. I think it really is the worst alibi anyone has ever given for anything. And we'll talk about that uh, along with a number of other important topics as well. But first, a word from Quip. You know, Quip, makers of the Quip electric toothbrush, want you to know that the one single discovery that matters the most for your dental care is simply this, that if you have good habits, you're good. It's basic and simple as that. Uh, And that means brushing for two minutes twice a day, flossing regularly, no matter what brand you use, Quip makes that simple, starting with an electric toothbrush, refillable floss, and anti-cavity toothpaste. Quip's electric brush has sensitive sonic vibrations with a built-in timer and 30-second pulses to guide and full uh, to guide you through a full and even clean. So it's, you know, it's like going to the dentist, except uh, you don't have to actually go to the dentist. That's the best part about it. The Quip floss dispenser comes with pre-marked string to help you use just enough. Plus, Quip delivers Fresh brush head uh, floss and toothpaste refills to your door every three months with free shipping. And so this is all about getting you into that routine, keeping you in the routine, and making sure that it's always right. Join over 3 million healthy healthy mouths and get Quip today, starting at $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash Walsh right now, you'll get your first refill for free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash Walsh, spelled G E T. Q-U-I-P dot com slash Walsh. Quip, the good habits company. Okay. Colin Kaepernick, the former mediocre NFL quarterback who coincidentally discovered a passion for social justice once his star had faded already after an abysmal 2015 uh, campaign with the 49ers when he lost five, six of, of the eight games that he started and posted only six touchdowns against five interceptions. Uh, That Colin Kaepernick was scheduled to work out for 25 teams this past Saturday. And I think the circumstances of this workout are unusual and worth, uh, worth reflecting on here for a moment. Kaepernick, of course, has been out of the league since 2016. That's the same year that he began his infamous anthem protest. But I think more salience to his three years of unemployment is the fact that not that he had the anthem protest in 2016, but that he went one in 10 that season, um, posting only about 2,241 yards, passing 16 touchdowns before getting benched for Blaine Gabbert. And if you don't follow football, let me just tell you that getting benched for Blaine Gabbert is the NFL equivalent of your dance troupe replacing you with Sean Spicer. It, It really doesn't get any more humiliating than that. Kaepernick, though, as he's been unemployed, has done pretty well for himself during his period of joblessness, better than most people do when they're out of work for three years, signed a multi-million dollar um, ad deal with Nike, and uh, he's been hailed across the media as a civil rights martyr. So not a bad side gig while you're out of work. But the point here is that he'd fallen out of his short-lived prime well before his anthem antics started. And uh, and you might even say that that's not a coincidence. That, that in fact that's the reason why he started with the anthem antics then and not before. Um, so he'd fallen out of his prime, and then he spends 
three years shooting Nike ads instead of playing football. Now, I'm not aware of any other case, and I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm just not aware of any other case. It's certainly unusual for the NFL to hold a private midseason workout on a Saturday, no less, the day before game day, okay? Um, teams are getting ready, last-minute preparations for Sunday, for football Sunday. So this is on a Saturday in week 11 of the season. I'm not aware of a, of a workout like this, private midseason, attended by 25 scouts for a backup-level talent who's been out of the league for 35 months. Yet that's what Kaepernick demanded, and that's what he got. There is no conceivable football reason for the NFL to have gone to these lengths for Colin Kaepernick. He's not a star player. He never was a star player. He, he, he looked like he was threatening to maybe be a star player in that, uh, what was 2012 season where he went to the Super Bowl and lost, by the way, to Joe Flacco, um, which is another humiliation. So this is a guy who lost to Joe Flacco in the Super Bowl and then a few years later was benched for Blaine Gabbert. It, it really is. As annoyed as I am with Kaepernick, at the same time, I think, well, this is a man who suffered two of the worst humiliations that any person could ever possibly endure. But anyway, not a star player, never was a star player. Even, But even if he was a star player, it would still be highly unusual and probably unprecedented for the league to stage an event of this sort just for him in the middle of the season. But it still wasn't good enough for Kaepernick. Um, and it, actually, because I'm thinking about it, what could possibly be analogous to this? Well, you think about maybe, you know, Michael Vick was a star player. Michael Vick was a transcendent athlete, one of the prime all-star players of the, of the, of his decade, you know, the, the, the early 2000s, uh, obviously uh, left the, the league because he went to prison for dogfighting came back two years later after two years out of the league and he did, he came back and, and he had one uh, all pro season with the, with the Eagles, which was really impressive. But anyway, I, I don't think that the NFL, I'd have to go back and look, I'm pretty sure the NFL didn't do this for Michael Vick. What they did for Kaepernick, they didn't do for Vick. I'm pretty sure. And Vick was by far a bigger star than Kaepernick ever was. Um, but, uh, this was, as I said, not good enough for Kaepernick. And, and so the Nike salesman pulled out at the last minute, apparently deciding that, uh, sometime on Saturday morning that he needed to have the event open to the media. The NFL didn't want the event open to the media. They never agreed to that. And for perfectly understandable reasons, they weren't looking to have a Kaepernick Palooza media spectacle in week 11 of the of the regular season. They, were, they weren't looking to play host to a televised PR stunt for an out-of-work 32-year-old former bench rider. Why would they want to do that? Why, how could you possibly expect them to? They've already, and listen, I'll, uh, I'm no defender of the NFL as an organization, even though I enjoy the, the product on the field uh, with some exceptions. But uh, on this, how could you blame them? Of course, they didn't want media there. What, why would they want the media there? And I think any sane or reasonable person couldn't possibly expect them to. But Kaepernick is is plenty sane, but he's not reasonable. Or at least his reasons are entirely separate from the reasons of a real athlete who really wants to play football, which Colin Kaepernick does not. So the guy who wore pig socks mocking the police during a game back in 2016 canceled the, or, or rather pulled out of the league hosted event at the last minute, staged his own event instead, complete with news cameras and journalists. Of course, a lot of journalists there who don't follow football. And so they came and they watched Colin Kaepernick throw the football 50 yards in the air uh, to an uncovered wide receiver running down, uh, you know, doing a, a, just, just, just running a, a straight right route down, down the, down the sideline. And a bunch of, non-sports journalists see that and start talking about, wow, he looked great out there. This guy needs to be on a team stat. Yet just because you can do that doesn't mean that you're going to be a good quarterback in the NFL. A lot of people can do that. 
See, when you're when you're really evaluating, you're looking at things like footwork, uh, you know, uh, uh, his his accuracy and timing, explosiveness, his vision on the field, and those sorts of things, which are hard to evaluate at a, at a workout the way that this one was conducted. But in all of those areas, he's never been very good, and he's certainly going to be worse now than he was back when he was playing three years ago. Uh, Kaepernick also made another conspicuous wardrobe decision, sporting a uh, Kunta Kinte shirt, um, implicitly comparing himself with a slave. Now, I admit that I'm no history professor, okay, but I'm pretty sure that the plight of a multimillionaire who had to settle for hawking Nike shoes uh, because he couldn't get a job in the NFL really bears no resemblance to historical slavery. And then as if the whole look at me nature of the thing wasn't clear enough, Kaepernick then went and, and ranted to the reporters on the scene about how the 32 teams and Roger Goodell are running from the truth and running from the people. In fact, watch, um, watch his rant at the end of his workout. Look at this. Work you do for the people and telling the truth. That's what we want in everything. I've been ready for three years. I've been denied for three years. We all know why I came out here, showed it today in front of everybody. We have nothing to hide. So we're waiting for the 32 owners, the 32 teams, Roger Goodell, all of them to stop running. Stop running from the truth, stop running from the people. We're out here, we're ready to play. We're ready to go anywhere. My agent, Jeff Nally, is ready to talk to any team. I interview with any team at any time. I've been ready, I'm staying ready, and I'll continue to be ready. And to all the people that came out here today to support, I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. To the people that aren't here, I'm thinking of you. I appreciate you supporting from where you are. We'll continue to give you updates as we hear. We'll be waiting to hear from Roger Goodell, the NFL, the 32 teams. We'll let you know if we hear from them. Ball's in their court. We're ready to go. Now, I have been on my share of job interviews in my life, as, as have uh, many people, I've never considered canceling the interview at the last minute, changing venues, demanding that my, uh, my uh, pr prospective employer come to me rather than me to him, and then accusing him of running from the truth when he fails to immediately hire me. Now, that's, that's an interesting strategy. Maybe in my next job interview, I'll try it. You know, finish the interview. I come in dressed in purposefully uh, inflammatory attire, um, and then uh, at the end of the interview, uh, I say, "So, so do I have the job?" Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll call you. We'll get back to you. Stop running from the truth. I know what you're doing. You're running from the truth and from the people. The people want me to have this job. Now give it to me. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll give that a try. We'll see. It does seem very much like the strategy of a man who doesn't actually want the job that he's pretending to seek. Consider how this whole thing might have gone if Kaepernick did want to play football. Well, he would have scheduled his workout in the offseason, first of all, when a number of teams are still making roster decisions, deciding who their quarterback's going to be. Uh, and they would have had time, to, if they did offer him a contract, to integrate him into the offense. He could learn the playbook and everything. Um, and then he would have shown up to the venue in a spirit of gratitude and eagerness. He would not have worn a T-shirt advertising his martyr complex. He would not have scolded the NFL in front of news cameras. He would not have insisted on news cameras in the first place because it's not they're not the people that are going to be hiring him. He's, not, he's, not, he's trying out to be a football quarterback. Uh, not to be a cable news talking head. But if there were cameras there and he did talk to them, his post-workout comments would have focused on, imagine this, football. And he would have expressed a deep desire to make a roster and help a team win games. And he would have said stuff like that. You know, I just want to help a team win games. That kind of thing. That, that, those are the sort of things you say when you want to be on a football team. Kaepernick said none of that because he's not interested in playing football. He is a self-promoting fraud, and this is his very profitable, I must admit, con. This is a con. He's a con man. On a pragmatic level, you know, it's hard to argue with his logic. 
if you put the ethics and the morality and honesty and all that aside, you're not worried about that. It makes sense because with his diminished skill set, his advanced age, at least by football standards, he's 32. OK, um, uh, he, he, he could at best hope to be a kind of journeyman, second stringer, hopping from one roster to the other, waiting for a starter to go down so we can fill in for a few games. Um, kind of like Robert Griffin III right now, RG3. That's what he's doing. Now, RG3 is, is, um, is uh, three years younger than Kaepernick and was once more promising than Kaepernick was. But now he earns a couple million dollars a year uh, playing behind Lamar Jackson. He's kind of Lamar Jackson's mentor and backup. And he's good in that role because he's gotten control of his ego and he's trying to help the team win. And he's, and he's now, uh, whereas before there might've been issues with this, but now he's kind of humble and, and, and he's not, uh, trying to make, make it all about him. And it's, it's a nice way to make a living. Look, if I can make a living, if I could get paid $2 million a year to be a backup quarterback in the NFL, I would do it, but it's not as rich or glamorous of a life. Uh, as, as the life of a not Nike-sponsored professional martyr. Kaepernick has carved out that niche for himself. The professional martyr, Nike sponsor. He got a Nike sponsorship as a professional martyr. No one's ever done that before. And that is better for him. I, I guess he's decided that he'd rather do that than accept the comparatively humble existence um, of a comparatively low-paid bench warmer in the NFL. And that's why Cap and his team of PR reps have made sure to stay in that zone between trying for a job in the NFL and actually landing a job in the NFL. They don't want to, they don't want to cross over into landing a job, so they just stay in that zone and they've discovered that that zone is filled with money and clout. Now with all this in mind, it would be incredibly stupid and counterproductive for any team to offer Kaepernick a contract. Of course, you can't put it past an organization like the Bengals or the Jets to do an incredibly stupid and counterproductive thing. That's all they do, after all. But uh, nonetheless, he is a washed-up second-string quarterback who, in the very best-case scenario, if he's able to reach the meager heights from which he fell in 2016, um, maybe could get you 2,000 yards and you know, a dozen or so touchdowns at, at best. Now, most backups in the league can get you that or better. And the thing is, none of them are going to bring the media circus along with them. None of them will threaten to turn your fan base against you. None of them have the potential to rip your locker room into pieces the way that Kaepernick does. Um, and none of them are likely to call you a racist if you have to cut them which eventually you will. All backup quarterbacks basically inevitably get cut or retire. So Kaepernick's production, even in the best case possible scenario, could not possibly come close to compensating for the massive downside. I'm not sure that even Tom Brady in his prime could compensate for a downside as steep as Caps. And Kaepernick is no Tom Brady, to say the least. This is... This is not, everyone talking about it's a conspiracy by the league. They don't want Kaepernick. It's not a conspiracy. This is very simple. If you're an NFL owner, why in God's name would you ever hire this guy? He, he's given everything I just mentioned, the very high likelihood, fan base turns against you, locker room is ripped in half because some of the players are going to love him. Some are going to hate him. He makes it all about himself. He's very me focused. He's not a team player. And he wasn't a team player even back when he was on the, in the league. Um, and and you just you just absolutely know that if you cut him or if, if you know if you don't if if you bench him when he thinks he should be playing, he's going to start accusing you of racism all this stuff. Why would you ever bring that on yourself? He's not good enough for that. And even I mean, uh, some, take someone like Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow is, is not a narcissist or a fraud the way that Kaepernick is. Um, but Tim Tebow washed out of the NFL and couldn't get a job after he, he let, was left the Broncos and was on the Jets for a little bit. And I think he had a stint on the, on the Patriots and that was it. 
And the reason is, now, he has the talent to be a backup quarterback. He doesn't have first-string talent, but he has second-string talent, for sure. Um, but he's, got, he's had this whole media circus that follows him around, and that's not his fault. He, he didn't intentionally cultivate that circus the way that Kaepernick does. But nonetheless, he has it. And so teams are saying, I, you know, I don't, I don't want this for a backup. This isn't what you want in a backup. And you bring Tebow in and you're going to have all, you know, now all of a sudden half of the fans are going to be chanting for him to go on the field, even if, even, you know, even if the starting quarterback is better than him. Why would we want this? We don't want it. Um, maybe, though, as I think about it, you know, a, a, a contract offer from the Bengals, from a team like the Bengals, would, would be the most poetic result in all of this. After all of his maneuvering to avoid an offer, because like I said, he doesn't want one. It's not what this is about. But it would be pretty delicious to see him backed into a corner where he has to actually reject an offer because one is, one is made to him, um, thereby revealing the whole charade for what it is. Or he has to admit defeat and actually accept a fate worse than death, which is to be a Bengals quarterback. Um, as far as I see it, either of those options would be the most fitting and deserved end to the Colin Kaepernick saga, but I guess we'll see what happens. Okay, um, moving on. Prince Andrew, he was uh, a a good friend of the now-dead pedophile and sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein, who, of course, did not kill himself. He hung out with um, Epstein a lot, stayed at his house, went on trips with him and so forth. Now, he's also been accused, uh, Prince Andrew has, uh, by name specifically, of raping at least one woman. And that accusation comes from the woman herself, Virginia Roberts. She says that she was recruited as a child, a minor, was trafficked all around the world. We know that this is exactly the kind of thing that Kaepernick, or uh, that, that uh, uh, Epstein does. It's exactly the kind of thing that Epstein does. Um, and uh, so this is the accusation that she made against Epstein and, and Prince Andrew. And he was interviewed by the BBC. Now, the, the way the BBC interview phrases this is that he was accused of having sex with uh, Virginia Roberts. But that's, that's not the right term here. The proper term is rape. He was accused of raping Virginia Roberts, who was a minor and was sex trafficked. Okay. Um, and she was raped, she says, by many men, but Prince Andrew was was one of them. And this happened, she says, three times. Now, F- Prince Andrew was finally interviewed by the BBC. And it really is a sight to behold and to hear. I don't think I've ever seen a denial that so clearly seems to confirm the accusation. What I mean is I've, I've never seen anyone deny something and look and sound so guilty as they deny it. It really is incredible. So first, here's Prince Andrew explaining that he hung out with a pedophile because of his great sense of honor. Listen to this. One of Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yeah. has made allegations against you. She says she met you in 2001. She says she dined with you danced with you at Tramp Nightclub in London. She went on to have sex with you in a house in Belgravia belonging to Gerlin Maxwell, your friend. Your response? I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. None whatsoever. You don't remember meeting her? No. But you were staying at the house of a convicted sex offender? It was a convenient place to stay. There is, I mean, I mean, I've gone through this in my mind so many times. At the end of the day, um, uh, uh, with the benefit of all the hindsight that one could have, um, it was definitely the wrong thing to do. Um, but at the time, I felt it was the, it was the honourable and right thing to do. And I, I admit fully that, 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 that my judgement was probably coloured by my... Um, tendency to be too honorable, but that's just the way it is. Yes, he he stayed uh, with a, a convicted pedophile at a, at a convicted pedophile's house because he's too honorable. 
I mean, this would be a terrible answer in a job interview when, you know, when they ask you, what are your weakness, your greatest weakness, that question. Now, my answer to that used to be the classic of, uh, well, I work too hard. You know, so sometimes I, I forget to stop and smell the roses. Just such a hard worker. I, I, I'm just so focused. Sometimes I'm just so focused. I do such a great job of my, uh, you know, I, I do such a great job and I'm, I'm so dedicated that, uh, that I, you know, I, I tend to enjoy life a little bit less than I would otherwise. Um, that has typically been my answer. Everyone has a bad answer to that question. This one would be really bad even by those standards. And except it's a lot worse because this isn't a job interview. This is an interview with the BBC about rape accusations. And this is what he comes up with. And it gets worse, if you could believe it. Watch this. So you're absolutely sure that you're at home on the 10th of March. Yeah. She was very specific about that night. Mm -hmm. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating <laughs> and that she went on to have bath, there's a, there's possibly. A, there's a slight problem with, 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 with the sweating um, because uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat um, or I didn't sweat at the time. And that was, oh, was she? Yes, I didn't sweat at the time because I um, ha had suffered what I would describe as an overdose of adrenaline in the Falklands War when I was shot at. Uh, and I simply, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost impossible for me to, to, to sweat. And it's only because I have done a number of things in, in the recent past that I'm starting to be able to do that again. So I'm afraid to say that, 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 that there's a medical condition that says that I didn't do it, so therefore. Yeah. Um. He remembers, listen, he remembers not sweating. He remembers not sweating. He remembers that at the time when this didn't happen, he didn't sweat. He remembers not sweating as the thing did not occur. You see, it was a medical condition. So we can look at his, camp, uh, his, his, uh, his, his uh, calendar and say, oh no, oh, what day was that? Was that the 16th of, uh, of April? Let me check my, uh, 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 yeah, no, it says right here, I didn't sweat that day. Yeah, that was a non-sweating day. Yeah, it's my, I've got my, my uh, sweat schedule right here, my, my uh, you know, my sweat show, I, I call it, and uh, I keep track of all the days. I now, I did sweat the day before, um, on the, uh, the day before, between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m., I did a little bit of sweating, picked up some sweating about 8 p.m. to 8.30, uh, but then I didn't sweat again for another three and a half days. This is what he's trying to say. It, it is, I mean, it's stunning. And this is the kind of excuse that someone like Prince Andrew can make. Now, that's not going to work for a everyday peasant like me or you. Um, if we went with the, I, I know I didn't do it because I didn't sweat. If the brow doesn't drip, you must acquit. Uh, if, you, if you or I tried to go with that, it's not going to work. But Prince Andrew, yeah, he can say that. His excuses are, um, I hung out with a pedophile because I'm just too honorable. I'm such an honorable guy. And uh, you know that I didn't do this thing I'm accused of because I also don't sweat. I am a, an honorable, non-sweaty person. This is what you get now. Why does the royal family exist? This is why. A, a gaggle of crooks and leeches. Their only job is to be rich and live in a fancy house. What's the point? And why do Americans love these people? I've never understood that. We fought a war to be rid of them. And now we buy tabloid magazines. Oh, it says here that Prince Harry has athlete's foot. Wow. Did you see this? I don't get it. And listen, I understand tradition. When I talk about this, people always say, ah, it's tradition. It's tra well, aren't, aren't you a traditionalist? Don't you believe in tradition? Yeah, I believe in tradition. I think it's great to preserve tradition. But I think there are two mistakes that, that people often make with respect to tradition. One is to assume that something is bad and archaic and backwards and, 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 and barbaric and primitive just because it's a tradition. And so to try to overturn traditions simply because they are traditions. So that's a big mistake that people make in this culture, especially. And I'm, I'm totally against that. But then on the, on the other end of that extreme, there's the mistake of thinking that 
everything that is a tradition should just be preserved simply because it's a, it's a tradition. Even if it no longer serves the purpose it once served, even if it's now extremely counterproductive, even if it's, you know, uh, even if it's sort of devoid of all the meaning it once held, it just preserve traditions at all costs simply because they're traditions. And, you know, if people a long time ago did something and they can continue doing it, then we should keep doing that same thing just because those people did it. I think that's also the wrong approach. I think we should uh, respect tradition. We should take tradition seriously so that if our ancestor did, ancestor did have a tradition, we should at least, we should take that seriously. We should look at it and think, well, there's a reason why they did this and, and we shouldn't just toss it out, toss it on the trash heap without thinking. We shouldn't do that. But the royal family now is just, you know, it's, it's an embarrassment. And especially when you add this Epstein thing into it. Um, but it's not my concern because I'm not uh, British. So as I said, we fought a war so that we didn't have to deal with these people. Of course, then we came over here and now we've sort of turned our own political class into their own form of royalty. So I guess we don't have a lot of room, a lot of room to judge. Uh, by the way, here's a picture of Prince Andrew and Virginia Roberts. Says he never met her, but here's, here he is with her. Um, now he's got an explanation for that or a denial anyway. He says that it can't be him. It's not him. This must be, this must be some kind of trick or sorcery because, uh, he, he says he would never show that kind of affection in public. And, uh, he always wears a suit and tie. So that, that, that guy, you know, that guy in that picture, it's not him. It looks like him, but that guy is a sweaty slob. That guy is a sweaty, dishonorable, disgusting slob, which Prince Andrew definitely isn't, he says. All right. Um, before we get to emails, let's take a quick break. And well, I'm not even going to set this up. Look at this. That's that's like the Macarena, but somehow whiter. This thing they do now, this is this is the second video we've seen. This is the second disturbing footage we've seen of this. I don't even want to call it a dance. It's like if the Macarena and the YMCA dance had a baby. And then that baby grew up and had a baby with the chicken dance. And that's, you end up with this thing that they do in Pete Buttigieg's campaign. Uh, just... If you needed more reasons not to vote for the guy, I, I think that's probably all the reason you need. And there are a lot of other good ones too, but we, we don't even need to get past that. Okay, we're going to go to emails. Now, I did have, there's this, speaking of disturbing and creepy, uh, there's this legitimately disturbing and creepy Sprite ad um, where Sprite is trying to, uh, because this is what this is what companies do now with their advertisements, trying to push delusion and confusion onto kids and onto the culture. Um, but I think I'm going to save this discussion because it, it deserves a longer discussion. I think not at the very end of the show. So I'm going to save that for tomorrow. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, and instead we'll go right to emails. Matt Walsh at gmail.com. Matt Walsh at gmail.com is the email. This is from Dale says, hello, Matt, love your show and your witty sarcastic humor on the current ridiculousness this world produces. Helps me laugh through this, laugh through this craziness and realize life really isn't that serious. However, I'm coming to you for advice on a very serious matter. I want to ask my girlfriend for her hand in marriage, but I don't know if she feels the same way that I do. She's brought it up before and mentioned what kind of wedding she wants, but does that mean she's wanting to get married? Please help me. Dale, she's brought up marriage to you and told you what kind of wedding she wants. She wants to get married. Yes, 100%. I, so... The only thing that could make it more obvious, and maybe she's already done this, but if she's given you ring sizes, when you get to the to her bringing up her ring size casually, hey, by the way, just just so you know, my my I'm a my ring is a size seven. Um, in case you were wondering, uh, is that how ring sizes work? Is there a ring size? I, I forget. It's been a while. Anyway, that's the only thing that when, when she does that, that's the equivalent of, you know, one of those banners that the, that a, a helicopter flies across the, the beach when you're at the beach and there's a big helicopter advertising 
a deal at the car dealership or something. That's the equivalent of that. If she put it on a, please propose to me. So she's not quite there, but she's almost there. And so, yes, get that ring, make it happen, Captain. Um, and congrats in advance on your pending nuptials. God bless. This is from John. Matt, when you move your head a certain way, the globe in the back makes it look like you have a man bun. Just thought you should know. The globe in the back. Um, let me see. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. I, I could see the man. Actually, not a bad look. See, there's my man bun. That's what it would look like if I had a man bun. Not too bad. The people hate on the man bun, but maybe, uh, maybe it works for some people. Who, who would have thought? All right. Oh, you can also see my um, back there. That's my uh, artwork that my, my daughter did, her portrait of me, which I've displayed proud, proudly on my bookshelf there. She gets her artistic talent not from me. I can tell you that. Um, what else here? This is from Drew, says, Mr. Walsh, as a child, my mother would give us green beans and ketchup. I remember the dish fondly and taught, uh, it taught me to eat my greens. I occasionally use ketchup with fries and somewhat agree with your point. The question is, is there an acceptable way to use ketchup that does not insult the dish in which it is used? Drew, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but your mother was trying to poison you. Call the police. It's not too late. Ketchup on green beans is an insult. You know, if you're going to, I don't know how she prepared the green beans. But if you want to season green beans, the classic salt and pepper will do just fine. You want to throw a little bit of garlic powder, some Parmesan on there. I'm not going to have a problem with that. Ketchup, there's no place for ketchup on green beans. There's no place for ketchup, period, on any dish. Because, as I said, if you're putting ketchup on your fries, it means your, your fries were poorly seasoned. If you're putting ketchup on your hamburger, uh, it means that... Uh, it means that, number one, the, the hamburger was poorly cooked and poorly seasoned. And also, apparently, you don't have access to any of the other sauces or condiments that would be acceptable on a hamburger. If you want to go mayonnaise, that's fine. You want to go mustard. You want to go, uh, you want to go bar any of the various times, types of barbecue sauce. There's no reason for ketchup once you get above the age of about 12. Um, let's see. All my, all my emails are basically about food, which I'm not complaining about. This is from Suzanne says, hi, Matt. I have enjoyed reading your insightful commentary and wit for several years and was pleased to hear that you joined the Daily Wire team. Your podcasts are a highlight of my weekly listening experience. And while I generally concur with most of your opinions, I have on occasion disagreed, such as with your take on internal household temperatures, but hadn't felt the need to write. After laughing at your incredulity concerning chili and cinnamon rolls, however, I thought it important to educate you on the culinary virtue of such a combination. Let me preface with this. I'm a Missouri girl and had never had chili with anything other than crackers. My husband, who hails from Kansas, grew up with chili and cinnamon rolls, served in school back when school kitchen ladies actually cooked good homemade food. Well, apparently not, Suzanne, if they're serving cinnamon rolls and chili. Eventually, I learned to make exceptional cinnamon rolls, which I bake several times a year. And always when I make chili, as we say in our household, it's against the law to serve chili without cinnamon rolls. That's the exact, I think the, the truth is the exact opposite of that, actually. And we've converted several guests to this belief as well. They are simply a complimentary combination of savory and sweet, like peanut butter and jelly, sea salt and caramel, or popcorn and candy. The biggest difference is one bite typically wouldn't contain both, except by those who are extremely adventurous. Depending on preference, they can either be eaten by alternating bites, as one would eat a piece of garlic toast with an Italian dish, or most properly, by popularly, by eating the savory chili as the meal and finishing with the sweet rolls as dessert. This brings a hearty cold weather meal to a satisfying close and agreed upon by more than Midwesterners. Um, I, I don't know what else to say on this. I've already, dis I've already communicated my disgust, my moral outrage, about chili with cinnamon rolls. And I've gotten so many emails from people defending this abomination before God. And I also want to make it clear because a lot of these emails are making straw men of, of, of my position. There have been a lot of emails defending cinnamon rolls in principle. I don't have any issue with cinnamon rolls. Of course I enjoy cinnamon rolls. Who doesn't? I'm an American. Okay, I'm not a psychopath. But 
I'll have a cinnamon roll with breakfast. Okay. That's the proper time. Or you want to have it as, you know, you can have it really any time of day as its own thing. If you're, if you're walking through the airport and you pass by a Cinnabon and you feel like hating yourself and being depressed and having a stomach ache on the plane, then have a, then, you know, have a Cinnabon, go for it. All I'm saying is that the pear with chili is, is, uh, it's, it's not just that it's a bad culinary choice. What I am proposing is that it is ethically and morally problematic. And I think if you looked in the Bible, and I don't have time to quote it right now, but I'm, but I'm pretty sure if you looked in the Bible, you would find that you'd, you'd find some backup on this point. Um, finally, this is from, well, this is, okay. This is from Amanda. It says, you have been discussing strange food pairings, and I thought I'd share mine. My grandfather grew up in Philly and taught us about the wonderful pairing of peanut butter and mayonnaise. I grew up eating peanut butter, mayonnaise, and tomato sandwiches. If we were feeling extra fancy, we'd throw some onions on those suckers. Yum. We'd also eat cinnamon rolls with our chili as a side. Um, but to dunk, Monte Cristos are also something we enjoy here in Colorado. Peanut butter, mayonnaise, tomato, and onion. I think I've just lost the will to live. I don't even want to... This, this descrip- the description of that dish makes me long for the cold embrace of death. It makes me think that human civilization itself was a mistake. This is, my God, my God have mercy on us. God have mercy on us all. As if I needed more reasons to hate Philadelphia. Now I've got another one. Add it to the list. Uh, I was going to read like five other emails, but I'm too nauseated to continue. So we will end the show there. You just re- ruined the whole show, Amanda. I hope you're, hope you're proud of yourself. And uh, that's it then. Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring, senior producer Jonathan Hay, supervising producer Mathis Glover, supervising producer Robert Sterling, technical producer Austin Stevens, editor Donovan Fowler, audio mixer Mike Coromina. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2019. If you want to delve the depths of leftist madness, head on over to The Michael Knowles Show, where we examine what's really going on beneath the surface of our politics and bask in the simple joys of being right.